Good morning, friends. Good to be with you again. My very first uh, computer that I owned, I went through uh, college uh, using computers uh, at school. But the very first computer that I owned was a desktop model. It was an Apple IIe dual disk drive, 512K of storage on each disk. The next computer that I purchased was actually a, uh, well, I wouldn't call it a laptop, <laughs> but it was portable. It was a Compaq SLT 286, and it weighed about 3,000 pounds. <laughs> it was a beast. It would fold up into this little suitcase-like thing, but it was portable. And uh, that, I think, had 20 meg of storage on it. I was just so, so excited to have a big... Computer. So I started with an Apple, but then I moved to the IBM PC uh, world, and I've been uh, a PC guy ever since. Now my older kids, they've bought their own computers to go to college. They've gone to the dark side, and they've gone to Macs. But uh, the MS-DOS world and uh, Microsoft uh, Windows has been the environment that I've used for all my work. Uh, and so Microsoft Word has been the word processor that I've uh, lived with for many years. And Word has within it a uh, feature that has saved me time and again. And that feature is spell check. <clears throat> As I'm typing along, the, uh, the program can, uh, will s strive to make sense of my nonsense. Uh, and my typing isn't always the most accurate. Well, as I was preparing the message this week, uh, I didn't get four words into uh, the, the, the sermon, and, and I uh, came up uh, with an error. Uh, I was just working on the title, and it was uh, telling me I was wrong. Uh, I have entitled this message, Peace and Mutual Upbuilding. Uh, phrases uh, directly straight out of the ESV, English Standard Version of Romans 14 that I'm going to read for you in a moment. Um, but as I typed, up the, uh, typed in the word upbuilding, uh, Word was telling me that it was, uh, it was wrong. It was not a word that the program recognized. And I tried to look up online just how many words are in the dictionary for Microsoft Word. And I didn't find any figure, but it's got to be in the multiple tens of thousands, 50,000, 100,000 words probably in there. Upbuilding is not one of them. Uh, it didn't recognize it. And the fact of the matter, friends, is, is that our world probably doesn't recognize that word very well. Uh, upbuilding, uh, mutually upbuilding, encouraging, um, um, building up uh, is just a, a reality. It's a, it's a, a life uh, choice that uh, we don't see a lot of nowadays. We're living in these times of incredible upheaval and just terrible unrest. Uh, but God uh, calls us in his word to live differently. So I want to look at Romans 14, and I'm going to read the whole uh, chapter for us uh, this morning. So if you have your scriptures at home, turn to Romans uh, 14 with me. And Paul says in Romans 14, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that, th that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he, give thank, he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks, gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. 
For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, as it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let What you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Join your hearts with me as I pray for our time in the Word today. Father, we just ask for your spirit to bring illumination and truth to our hearts and minds as we cover this amazing passage of scripture that Paul has penned uh, for us. Lord, I just believe it's so timely in terms of our study of the word that you have us in Romans and in these particular passages while while the world is just going crazy around us, Lord, that you have... uh, principles and precepts for us to embrace that will help us to know how to live, what to do, and how to do it as we go forward in the world. Lord, would you bless your word in our lives? And this we ask, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's let's think a few moments about what Paul has said to us here. He says that we should welcome the one weaker in faith, but not so as to quarrel. And friends, you know, church history is just filled with arguments and battles, pitched battles. Uh, There's lots that we can argue about. But the question is, does that build the kingdom? Paul is encouraging us to be embracing uh, to our brothers and sisters in Christ. They may have different perspectives. They may have different uh, uh, opinions and beliefs based on their study of the word. But we need to be welcoming. We need to be hospitable. And there's a place for apologetics. Certainly there is. But we need to be sensitive to what helps and what hinders. Okay? And, and there's a, a place sometimes where I get where I'm right uh, but I haven't, I haven't uh, shown love. Uh, I, love being, uh, I love being right. I love winning uh, arguments. Uh, but sometimes that's ultimately uh, not what God wants to do in and through me uh, with regard to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul says, who are you to pass judgment? Okay. He's calling us to task, friends, and oftentimes we are quick to assign uh, labels and positions to people based on what we think uh, they're all about. Um, he says, who, who are you to pass judgment? And, and the issue is, do we really see the whole picture? Do we know all? God is judge because he does know all. He, not, he knows not only the outer circumstances and, and what is seen readily, but he knows the, the intents and the motivations of our hearts. He sees it all. He knows it all. So it's right and proper for him to be judge. But my knowledge is limited. Your knowledge is limited. We're, our, our, our knowledge is so finite. And, and all that we know, we've learned uh, through <laughs> certain perceptions, preconceived ideas, friends. And, and so this, this caution that Paul has for us, we need to grapple with seriously. We need to be quick 
uh, to, to listen and, uh, and slow to speak, it says in, in James. So we, we need to hear people out. And we need to extend grace. There is a place for judgment. We balance this uh, challenge from Paul with the other places in Scripture that in terms of body life, the body has um, a responsibility to make judgment. When somebody is, is in sin and refuses to, to leave sin, that oftentimes will make that judgment corporately that that person um, needs to be disfellowshipped. Uh, but in terms of personal judgments, Paul is speaking to us as individuals here, I think, and he's cautioning us to be careful uh, in terms of judging uh, the thing that we need to do is just love our brothers and sisters and, and let God do the judging. Again, he knows all. He understands all. And, and so he can render an appropriate judgment, whereas our knowledge is finite and limited. Uh, we're not always able to make the right judgment. We are able to love and to love unconditionally, as it's been said so many times recently in our study of the word. Paul goes on to say that we should be fully convinced. He's talking about those who eat certain things and don't eat certain things, those who observe certain days, those who don't observe certain days. He says, be fully convinced. So uh, from that, I think, friends, we, we need to understand and take away from, from this passage that there are some issues we need to investigate and come to a, a, a firm understanding of. He says, be fully convinced. Friends, I want to challenge us in these days that we live uh, in in our our great nation that is struggling so with race issues. I want to encourage us to become informed. Read some books on race from a non-white perspective. Uh, Again, I've noted last week in our study of Scripture that we as a congregation are pretty homogeneously white. Um, But we need need to uh, understand how someone else might view uh, these issues that are facing our world. <clears throat> and I'll say a little bit more about that in, in terms of application, but just in terms of this verse, verse 5, where Paul is saying, be fully convinced that, uh, that we need to spend some time and energy and effort. We need to expend the effort um, to be informed, to try and make uh, wise, uh, take wise positions in light of uh, God's Spirit bringing us to truth goes on, Paul says, that we are not our own. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. We're the Lord's, okay? We're the Lord's. And that truth, that bedrock reality that we are his and not our own, that we need to align ourselves with his character because he owns us. We are the sheep of his fold. We're lambs of his flock. He created us. He owns us. It just has amazing implication for our lives, friends. It, 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 it touches every aspect of our life, is that we belong to the Lord. Uh, he purchased us with the, the shed blood of Jesus at the cross of Calvary. He gave his very best for us uh, uh, at, at the cross. He gave his son. And so he spent um, un told unlimited uh, resources to bring us back to himself in light of that friends uh, that we we are it's incumbent upon us to uh, live life God's way um, because we're not we're not in control he owns us uh, we belong to him and, and that is our responsibility <clears throat> Paul goes on to say that uh, each of us, Each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Friends, if that's not a wake-up call for you, if that's not something that brings a a sobering, uh, uh, holy reverence and fear to your life, then you're not hearing me. (laughs) You're not hearing Paul. Paul says that every one of us will stand before God Almighty and give an account for how we live, what we did, what we thought, what we said, how we acted. We're going to answer for that. Now, we, our entrance to heaven is based on grace. It's based on what Jesus did do for us at Calvary. I don't earn my salvation. Okay, I can't, I, I can't go to judgment and expect that my, my thoughts, my words, my deeds are going to be my ticket into heaven because my righteousness, the very best I can do, is as filthy rags, it says in Isaiah. 
Okay, so I'm not trusting in my works to gain my salvation. Because Paul says in, in, in uh, Ephesians that it's not by works that we're saved, it's by grace. Okay, this issue is in terms of God judging us and giving us a reward that once saved and once headed towards heaven, then those who are his own who will spend eternity with him are going to be judged uh, so there's a two two part judgment in my mind in terms of what Scripture teaches that that the sheep and the goat are are separated the the sheep uh, being those who've uh, embraced Christ as Savior that they're they're headed to heavens so the goats are, are those that separated away we're going to spend eternity uh, apart from God but then the sheep go on to a, a second stage judgment and that judgment is with regard to the reward we may receive or not receive uh, from the Father for what we've done. Every person, every one of you listening to me right now is going to stand before God someday and give an account for your life. And I encourage you to do some soul searching now to avoid judgment from God later. Okay? Again, that's that issue of aligning ourselves with God's principle and with his character that if we are in some way not living up to what he has told us uh, how to live, then, then we correct it now so that we don't face uh, the, the judgment later. Each one of us will give our, an account of ourselves to God. Friends, uh, let that kind of uh, rumble in your soul uh, for a few days. Allow that to, to bring a, a weight uh, to the choices you make in life in terms of how you're living. So, uh, then Paul says that we're not to put uh, stumbling blocks before our brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, we're going to choose intentionally how we live uh, so as to be a blessing and not a hindrance. He says that the kingdom of God is all about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There's a great song from one of my favorite uh, uh, praise albums from way back in the day, Ron Canoli's uh, Maranatha Praise uh, Lift Him Up album. And uh, we've sung it a couple times uh, here in church. Uh, Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Um, and friends, I just think uh, how uh, sweet of God to remind us in this time of trouble uh, that, that there is joy available to us. And we know that happiness uh, really is based on outer circumstance. And our outer circumstance stinks right now. <laughs> you know, the light, world's going crazy all around us. And the world's falling apart all around us. So the outer circumstance, uh, we can't depend on that uh, for, uh, for happiness. Because it's not a happy time. But we still can have joy because that's an inner reality. Jesus in us, uh, the hope of glory is a source of joy no matter what the outer circumstance may be. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So Paul uses that to say then that we need to pursue peace. Okay. So as I think about that, I ask the question, I'm not warlike, so is that enough? And the answer is no, I need to pursue peace. So in these days of turmoil in our nation, when race issues are a huge concern, is it enough just for me not to be racist? And a term that people have used recently that has really resonated with my heart is, that no, I need to be anti-racist. It's not just enough not to be racist myself, but I need to be one who combats racism when I see it. I need to be one who's engaged to change the societal and cultural realities that, uh, that uh, are leading to racist uh, realities for my brothers and sisters. So we need to pursue peace. Okay? It's not a matter of just not being warlike. That's not sufficient. I need to pursue peace. I need to be active and engaged in, in doing what needs to be done to bring peace to the, the tempest that surrounds us. I need to be engaged. You need to be engaged. 
We need to do what we need to do to pursue peace and what serves for mutual upbuilding. Okay? And if that word's weird, just think of building up. We want to build up. We want to encourage. We want to, to, to uh, cheer on. We want to make happen. We want to provide an environment of nurture for growth and, and positive forward movement. Up building. I'm going to do what I can. So the question I ask myself is, what am I going to do to bless my brothers and sisters who are hurting right now? One of the phrases that has been a a point of contention is a phrase, uh, black lives matter. And I read recently something that really gave me, um, helped me to understand uh, the importance uh, in this moment of that phrase. And and this is uh, what I read. It it was uh, by a person named Doug Wilson, who I don't know. But he said this, if my wife uh, were to come to me in obvious pain and ask, do you love me? An answer of, I love everyone, would be truthful, but also hurtful and cruel in the moment. If a co-worker comes to me upset and says, my father just died, a response of, everyone's parents die, would be truthful, but also hurtful and cruel in the moment. So when a friend speaks up in an obvious time of pain and hurt and says, black lives matter, a response of, all lives matter, is truthful, but also hurtful and cruel in the moment. Now, <clears throat> there certainly <clears throat> could be aspects of the Black Lives Matter movement that we can't necessarily agree with fully. Okay? But is there a way we can come alongside our brothers and sisters and show our support? <clears throat> I received uh, just uh, yesterday uh, an email, an open letter from the uh, the district superintendents and the um, association presidents of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And it's so thoughtful, I'll I'll try and uh, get that to you folks as I can. Uh, But I want to quote uh, part of it. The opening uh, paragraph says this, We, the district superintendents and association presidents of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, who give oversight to Alliance churches and ethnic associations in the United States, Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, and Guam, and who function in this movement under the oversight of the vice president for church ministries, formally denounce racism, injustice, and any and all systems and actions of any group and or laws that seek to make themselves racially and or ethnically superior over any other group of people, including blacks, Native Americans, Asians, and Hispanics. We stand in staunchest opposition to groups that promote white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and others that avow discrimination and segregation of any kind. And then it concludes with this. It says, finally, to the members and adherents of our movement, that compromise the black community, we say today that we lament with you. We are listening to you. We seek to be agents of change with you, and we stand alongside of you. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. That's how their opening open letter to our movement ends. So powerful, so very, very powerful. So a lot is being torn down right now, and I think as a church, we can do something about that. Paul says that we need to seek peace and do what is needed to be done for mutual upbuilding. And I want to challenge us, church, uh, in that. So, point of application. Last week in Romans, at the end of Romans 13, and this week in terms of, again, addressing the, the racial issues that are dividing our country. Uh, I, I mentioned last week the idea of, of uh, white privilege. And I just want to s- spend a moment clarifying what I mean by that. Uh, sometimes I've heard a typical response when speaking of uh, white privilege to other white people that uh, the response is, well, if that's really a thing, then sign me up for that. I want privilege. And, and you're misunderstanding me if you're hearing me say that. For me, white privilege does not mean that necessarily you are rich or necessarily you're powerful or necessarily you've had an easy life. It simply means that however hard your life may have been thus far, it would have been even harder had you been a person of color. 
So it's not white privilege isn't saying that you have it all. Okay? It's just understanding that, that uh, you've been given much. And that's a biblical uh, principle that we need to grapple with too in, in this whole uh, experience that we're in the midst of. Is that uh, to whom much is given, much is required. And friends, again, as a, as a congregation, we're pretty homogeneously uh, white in composition. Um, we have experienced amazing blessing as a fellowship, as a congregation. God has poured blessing upon blessing upon us. We, we're a small uh, country church, yes, but uh, we have uh, just seen God's hand richly poured out in terms of grace upon grace, so financial blessing, um, the, the peace and unity that we have as a body. Are we perfect? No, far from it. But there's so much health and wholeness in us as, as a body of Christ. I'm just familiar with <laughs> lots of churches out there that, uh, that don't have, even though they were small country church, they don't have what we have, friends. Too much is given, much is required. Friends, God has given us much. And as Paul said, individually, but also I believe as a body, we're going to be held to account someday. And so in terms of application of Romans 14, it begins by Paul saying, when the, when the weaker, one of weaker faith comes into your midst, welcome them. Okay? That, that we need to be on the lookout for those who are hurting, those who are downtrodden, those who've been marginalized. I, I shared that one screen. Again, I want to try and get it to you as I can. But uh, just 90 out of the many verses that could have been quoted about justice, that, that we have God's heart on this topic, that we, 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 we respond rightly. So we've been given much. Uh, we're required to do much. We need to be engaged. So last week, the, 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 the premise was that, that love can overcome uh, the hurts and evils of our world. And the question that was posed of me, well, what does that love look like? What does that love look like? And Romans 14 that we're parked in today is part of that answer. He's given us instruction how we, we prefer the other. We, we put others' needs ahead of our own. That, that I may have a perspective that I can eat whatever I want to eat, but if, if my brother or sister in Christ would be offended, then I, I censure myself. I change my actions. I change what I do because I don't want to be a stumbling block or a hindrance to their faith. Okay? I believe that has application for our, our culture and society right now in terms of us as Jesus followers and, and responding in a timely fashion to what we see happening all around us. Having clarified that, um, I again want to challenge us to become informed. Um, and I want to encourage us to be readers, okay? And again, I encourage you to read things from a non-white perspective. Um, why is that? Well, because the, the, white, the white author has uh, certain, certain insights that uh, someone of color might have, have a different insight. Um, reading, again, reading is so important. <clears throat> we have a book that's been a part of our library at home about Robert E. Lee. And um, the opening, uh, very opening words say this, Robert E. Lee was one of the most truly remarkable men in our nation's history. The author writes, quote, I searched diligently for a flaw in Lee's character. There was none. Now, <clears throat> I kind of take exception to that statement right off the bat because I think there's only one person in all of history who had no flaw in their characters and that's Jesus Christ. So I realize he's probably using hyperbole to make a point. He's exaggerating. But my, my, my concern is, is Lee worthy of that effusive praise to say that he has, his character has no flaw? Well, as I study history, I see that Lee was certainly a great general, a great tactician, um, but uh, he was a slave owner. And when some of his slaves ran away, uh, and they were caught, he had them whipped. 50 lashes for the man, 20 for the woman. And then beyond that, he had salt brine poured on their, their backs on the open wounds. To me, friends, that's a flaw in character. <laughs> I don't think that's right and proper. Okay? But, but so in terms of encouraging you to read history and, and to be informed, that we need to understand that some of what we read and some of what we've been uh, taught um, maybe isn't the whole picture. Okay? This is maybe hard for us to hear. Maybe, maybe it's something we're, we're uh, a little uncomfortable with, but friends, truth matters. 
John 8 says, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Truth matters. Sometimes today, truth is in really short supply. And I want to challenge you to, to broaden your horizons in terms of, of what you're reading and what you're hearing. Okay? Broaden your horizons. There may be insights that God can bring to your life uh, from, from a new source. Okay? We need to read, we need to listen. I encourage you in terms of reading. Reading is great, but uh, to hear uh, people of color speak about this, this issue, you know, through podcasts or, or uh, broadcasts, that, uh, t- to hear the hurt and pain in their voice. It's one thing to read it in black and white on the page. I encourage you not only to read, but to listen. And if you have friends in your life who you can pursue a deeper relationship, people of color who you can ask, well, what, what do you think about this? What, what, is, what is your perspective on what's happening today? It's important for us to do. Okay? And all of it is in order to seek understanding. Okay? Paul says be fully convinced. And so we want to, we want to come to a, a right understanding. I think about where would Jesus be in all of this today? What would he be saying? What would his leadership be like about this issue that's facing our world and our nation? As I read the Gospels, I think he was a pretty radical guy. And he said some pretty radical things. So I want you to become informed. I want to encourage you to give. Okay? Give of your, uh, your time and your talent and your treasure. And uh, part of that process is, is finding worthy causes to give to and, and, and vetting uh, where we spend uh, kingdom resources is, is critical. Uh, there's lots of people clamoring for our money. Not everybody is worthy of it, friends. So uh, in terms of uh, addressing justice issues, there, there are a lot of people who are right now on the front lines. Again, some of them we may not be able to fully link arms with. That They, they stand for things, they're promoting things that we can't necessarily um, get behind. Uh, but there are those out there, I think, uh, who may be different from us, but they're like-minded enough that uh, we would be able to, to uh, come alongside. Again, too much is given, much is required. Uh, we need to put our money where our mouth is and, uh, and be engaged. Francis Schaeffer used the phrase co-belligerence. Uh, I thought it was uh, fascinating in his life and his teaching that, again, there are some who I disagree with strongly about things, but on, on certain common points of, uh, of wanting to address issues in the world that I can, I can line up with. Pray, the Holy Spirit will lead you. The Holy Spirit will guide you, friend, in terms of what's right and what's appropriate. In the end, again, I think Paul is calling us to be careful that we not lay any hindrance or stumbling block before our brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 13 uh, challenged us to live in subjection to the authorities above us. We, We grappled with that reality called us to to love unconditionally all those around us. And here, Romans 14, I think Paul breaks down what that unconditional love might look like. That I'm going to put uh, the concerns, the perspectives of uh, my brother or sister um, in in full view uh, in front of me so that I can can engage, I can love, I can care for in meaningful ways. Question, friend, is what if we say or do nothing? What if we say or do nothing about all that's happening around us? Desmond Tutu uh, said this, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Quote goes on to say, if an elephant is standing on the tail of a mouse, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. What if we say or do nothing? <clears throat> if we say or do nothing, we're standing up, in a sense, for the oppressor. And that's not a place where we want to be. If we say or do nothing, God's going to judge us, friends. We're going to die and stand before God Almighty someday and give an account for our lives. So in closing, I want to turn 
to Isaiah 58. I thought about it in terms of last week's message, but I uh, feel like the final words on this topic will be the Lord's through his prophet. Prophet Isaiah says this. I'm going to read the whole chapter. We need to hear it. <clears throat> Isaiah 58 says, Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour out yourself for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as, new, as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not, giving your own, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or t talking idly, then... Shall, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I want to pray. Father, we uh, hear your words, both from Paul and Isaiah, that we're to, to care for the hurting brother or sister near us. We're to take into consideration uh, where they're at, Lord. We're to, to break the yoke of bondage. We're to set the oppressed free. Lord, would you so work in our hearts and lives? Would you give us clarity of thought and mind, Lord, to know how rightly to respond in a timely fashion in this pivotal moment in our nation and our world's history? God, we, we believe that, uh, that this is an opportunity for the kingdom at adva to advance. This is an opportunity for the church to shine, Lord, for the church to lead the way and not lag behind. So God, help us to know what to do and how to do it. You've called us to show un unconditional love. And Lord, I believe part of that you've, uh, you've described for us here in Romans 14. So, Father, we, we want to live for your glory and honor. We want to think and say and do those things that will bless your heart and bring healing 
to the hurting all around us. Father, we pray for healing in our land. We pray for the end of racial division, Lord. We pray against racism in all its ugly forms, Lord. We pray against against white supremacy and those who think that because of their light-colored skin that they're better than somebody else. Lord, we, we just pray for that to be broken in the name of Jesus. Lord, that thought form, that, that, that philosophy that is so far from you, God, so far from your heart, we just pray that you'd speak the word of rebuke and break that, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, uh, give us wisdom as we move forward. Lord, we understand uh, that uh, uh, small though we may be, we have been given much as a fellowship And so much of us is required. Lord, I'll say of myself, I've been given much personally, and much is required of me. Lord, I live under the the weight and the onus of Paul's statement that I will die someday and stand and give an account before you for my life. And Lord, that's not... Um, forgetting about grace. That's not, not, not seeming like I have to trust in my works in order to gain uh, your pleasure. I understand grace, Lord. I embrace grace as the only answer to my sin issue, Lord. But I know, Lord, as Scripture has taught me, that, uh, that having been saved, now I need to manifest that life in Christ in me all my days. And so, Father, would you, would you pour out your spirit afresh and anew to, uh, and, and fill me, Lord. And, and as I pray for myself, I pray for, for all my brothers and sisters in Christ and here in this fellowship, Lord. Would you fill us to overflowing with your spirit, that your kingdom is righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. We pray that those realities would be with us in this week ahead. And that we could, we could be filled so with righteousness and so with peace and so much with joy, Lord, that as we, as we bump into our neighbors and family members and friends and coworkers, Lord, that that would just spill out uh, like, like water over parched land, Lord, that it would just bring refreshing, Lord. Use us to bring refreshing wherever we go. We love you. We need you. We desperately cry out for you to be God and King in our lives, for you to rule and reign and overrule in the affairs of our nation and world, and that you would be advancing your kingdom through our efforts, Lord. We ask that you'd use us to be agents of reconciliation. We love you and commit our ways to you and ask your blessing. Bless this word in our lives this week ahead. We love you and give you worship and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, here at the closing, I just do want to say that uh, the elders and I are continuing to uh, pursue uh, the, the, the desire to be uh, meeting uh, here in this sanctuary uh, in person. And uh, this sermon we're recording for uh, Sunday, June uh, 14th. It's my hope that I'll be able to communicate with you early in this next week about actually meeting here uh, in a socially distant, safe way uh, for Sunday, June the 21st. And uh, again, there's, there's lots that we're figuring out how to do that well and how to do that safely. Uh, but please be on the lookout uh, for that, uh, that communique that we'll send your way, either email or, or snail mail. And um, I know many will choose not to be coming at this uh, juncture for their own safety, and uh, we, we respect and honor that. Uh, but for those who are able, uh, we have been given permission from our uh, civil leaders, again, Romans 13, being in submission to them, that uh, we can fill this uh, sanctuary up to 25% capacity. And uh, we can easily sit 200 here, so we're shooting for the figure of 50 uh, for the, the first few weeks. Uh, we hope to have that service recorded or maybe live streamed. Again, we're working on details. Uh, but be in prayer for us uh, that, that God will lead us and direct us. Uh, but I do look forward to seeing many of you, I hope, even next week. And uh, for those who will choose to um, embrace the online options, uh, know that we love you and we miss you. And uh, God will have us all together soon. Thank you and God bless you.